Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, welcome to the National Museum of the United States Army. We are so pleased to be together again this Tuesday night, where we're joined by Dr. John Moss, who will be presenting the program tonight, The Battle Brief, A Most Terrible Bloody Conflict, Major General Joseph Hooker and the Battle of Chancellorsville, May 1st through 3rd, 1863. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Moss. Okay, thanks, Liz. I appreciate it. We are going to take a lightning fast look at the Battle of Chancellorsville. It was a three day battle. Arguably, it could also be called a four day battle with some of the, uh, some of the end. Uh, skirmishes and maneuverings. So we've, we've got to get a lot packed in. Uh, I'm not really going to be going down to the brigade level uh, of, of maneuvers and fighting and positions just because of the scope of this action. But uh, hopefully this will give you a great overview. We've got some period maps. We've got some modern maps, uh, period images, and also modern images of some of the key locations of the battlefield. So. Again, uh, welcome, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, let's go to the first slide, if we could, Liz. Uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville, Vir Virginia, in 1863, in many ways derived out of the previous major engagement between the Union Army of the Potomac and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, which was at the Battle of Fredericksburg, December 13, 1862. And that's where uh, uh, General Ambrose Burnside was the commander of the Army of the Potomac, and he attacked Lee in very well dug in defensive positions. Uh, it was a it was a real bloodbath for Burnside and the Union Army, and uh, they retreated across the across the Rappahannock River um, to uh, after the battle, while Lee and his troops stayed in their defenses at Fredericksburg for the winter. And there was some minor skirmishing here and there, but for the most part, uh, it wasn't until the mid to late April that the, um, conf that the, the uh, active campaigning started up again. So let's move to the next slide. We have uh, the previous commander prior to Chancellorsville on our left here is Ambrose Burnside. And after he uh, had the disastrous attack with very heavy casualties at Fredericksburg, again, December, 1862, he also had another uh, uh, ill-conceived and, and, and weather thwarted famous mud march where uh, on a flank attack, it just literally mired down. And so he was considered to be ineffective and Lincoln uh, eventually in the spring replaced him with Joseph Hooker, who was a, a Corps commander in the Army of the Potomac. He had a very good fighting record. Uh, he, had a very, he was a division commander that had done well in the Peninsula Campaign earlier in 1862, um, was wounded at the Battle of Antietam when his troops attacked Lee's left fl flank for the north. So he did have a very good reputation. And one thing that Hooker did was uh, he, he was able to bring a higher level of morale to the Union Army of the Potomac by improving supply, uniforms, shoes, uh, mostly food. He was able to get the soldiers fed much better over the winter than they had been and uh, they were able to bring back a lot of the men who had deserted or gone AWOL. So the, he also divided his army into uh, several corps where, the, where each corps had a unique uh, designation and a, a patch and an emblem that they wore on their kepis um, and, and flags. So for example, diamonds, uh, clovers, circles, and that way, it, it gave the soldiers a sense of belonging to their corps and divisions, and it also made it easier to identify which troops were there for the commanders. So he did bring them back to a, a pretty good state of morale, considering that they had lost so terribly at Fredericksburg. So uh, our general here, Joseph Hooker, 
commanded several corps, and we'll we'll get into seeing where they were and who they were commanded by in a little bit. But he had a plan, and he decided that he was not going to send his entire army from the north side of the Rappahannock River across through Fredericksburg and attack Lee's strong position. That's what Burnside did, and that's why it ended in such a disaster. He had a he had a he had a plan that he uh, and the Lincoln administration military officials worked on together for logistics, for intelligence. And when we, we'll go to the next slide here and talk it, about it in more detail. So you can see this map. I've, I've, uh, I've put locations in bold red so it's easier to see. But through this, this Rappahannock Valley here, where you see Fredericksburg on the lower right, and then various fords across the Rappahannock to the west, to our left on this map. U.S. Ford, Ely's Ford, Germana Ford, and then above that, Kelly's Ford. And the Army of the Potomac was located in and around Fredericksburg and Stafford Courthouse. So what was Hooker's plan? Well, he decided he was going to uh, have two of his corps, one under Reynolds and one under Sedgwick, at the bottom right-hand corner of this map where it says feints, that they would cross the river with pontoons uh, or on pontoons, and they would attack or, or pretend to attack Lee's right flank uh, near Fredericksburg. The other corps that he had from uh, Stafford Courthouse, which you can see on the map, and Fredericksburg would make a very long, wide, uh, sweeping flank movement to the west on the north side of the Rappahannock, past Hartwood Church, and you can see a little yellow dot in the map and a modern day image of Hartwood Church, which is still standing, a very pretty place. And he would have them make a long flanking attack and cross the river at various fords starting at Kelly's Ford and Germana Ford, then come back toward Fredericksburg, now on the south side of the river, to get in Lee's rear. And that was his, that was his plan. So if we go to the next slide, we'll continue to talk about this. OK, so uh, the Union Army's main objective for at least the first day was after they marched and crossed the rivers is to try to get to a crossroads called Chancellorsville. Now, Chancellorsville, despite its name, was not a village. It really was just a very large brick uh, inn and tavern and residence of the chancellors who lived at the intersection of Ely's Ford Road and Orange Turnpike, which is modern Route 3 that goes west from Fredericksburg out to Culpeper. So you can see uh, these are modern, these were uh, period images that were done at the time of the battle. And you can kind of get a feel for some of the terrain there at Chancellorsville. So let's go to the next slide. OK, so I've marked Chancellorsville on the map. And this is on May 1st. The day before, April 30th, uh, many of the troops on that wide flanking march had crossed the river and moved east, according to the plan, uh, Hooker's plan, to get in Lee's rear and attack him. So this is the situation late on May 1st, because eventually Lee would discover that the bulk of the Union Army was now coming at him from the West. So many historians consider this battle, as, and as you'll see, you can make your own judgment, to be uh, Lee's finest tactical success. But for a while, it looked like Hooker was going to be true to his word and lick Robert E. Lee. Those were his those were his words, and that, that if he hoped God had mercy on Robert E. Lee because 
he said he would not have any. He was very confident. And to a large extent, when you look at this map, he had every right to be. So if we'll go through this map together, over on the top right side, you'll see where Meade is with his fifth core uh, above the word Fredericksburg. He was on the river road heading toward Fredericksburg. Down at the bottom of your map, uh, Hooker had his troops under General Sykes on the Orange Turnpike. And then in the lower middle section, you'll see Slocum with his corps marching on the Orange Plank Road. And this was a way to get the maximum number of troops at, to, toward, to go toward Fredericksburg and not pile up one on top of each other in, on these roads. There was a lot of difficult terrain in here. This is the eastern uh, edge of the wilderness, which was a very thick vegetation, uh, very difficult to communicate between those three roads. So, um, but Hooker had gotten himself and most of his men in the Chancellorsville area, which you can see I've drawn an arrow to that crossroads uh, to Chancellorsville and had been doing very well. In fact, the, the troops were confident, the officers were confident, uh, Hooker seemed to have confidence too. However, the Union Army was up against arguably the best of the Confederate commanders. Robert E. Lee, who was the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, and Thomas Stonewall Jackson who was one of Lee's two corps commanders. He commanded the second corps. Um, they, Lee figured out eventually by uh, scouting, sending his cavalry to look out for the Union forces and eventually realized that the main Union thrust was in his rear coming across the river by way of, of Chancellorsville on the several roads to Fredericksburg. So he had to act. You can see down at the bottom, uh, this is the beginning of, um, of the Confederate response. At the very bottom of your map, uh, where you see the word Anderson, uh, that was part of the troops that Jackson uh, moved quickly west from Fredericksburg to try to stop Hooker's army from advancing. And so he had part of his men on the bottom road, which was the Orange Plank Road, and then you can see up above, uh, he also had men that were on the Orange Turnpike. And because of the limited nature of maneuver and limited visibility, Jackson's men appeared uh, seemingly out of nowhere, unexpected by the Union commanders. So Slocum stopped um, <clears throat> on the Orange Plank Road and above him, Sykes was stopped on the Orange Turnpike. Uh, all of a sudden, the rapid advance was not advancing as rapidly as it could. So let's move to the next slide, please. And this is a great image of Sykes's men on the Orange Turnpike. And you can see that column on the left. And if you look closely, it kind of snakes off into the background and that's where they met with Jackson's troops on that road. So in this image, they pulled up some artillery, but Jackson's men were, uh, were, were a roadblock that made Sykes uh, kind of pull up short and start to think about deploying his troops to the east and west of the road. And the same thing was going on uh, to the south of him uh, on the next road, which was the Orange Plank Road. So this is a good wartime image that you can that, that was done, uh, sketched out at the time of the battle by, by an observer. Okay, let's go one more, please. Okay, this is a, by the same artist. This was a scene at Chancellorsville on that day one. The Chancellorsville house, you can probably make out on the right. You can see the chimneys. And then the main Confederate attacks and, and the Union efforts to push through them are toward the center and the right of this image, looking toward, uh, this image is basically looking toward 
the south and southeast. Okay, let's keep going. Now, these were the Confederate commanders. Uh, most of you probably have seen these images before, uh, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. They had a unique relationship. Uh, Lee trusted Jackson uh, very much and usually gave him broad leeway and, and latitude as far as accomplishing his missions. And Jackson uh, was, was, was an expert at carrying those out. Uh, Lee, Lee had a lot of trust in him. So these were, these were really the two, uh, arguably the two best commanders that the, that the army had or the Confederacy had, at least in the Eastern theater. And, uh, many would argue in the Western theater also. Um, so the, they, they realized, as I said, that Hooker was coming up from behind with the bulk of his men and that any activity back toward Fredericksburg where the feints were, were really not going to be pushed through uh, until a later time, if any. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Now, Lee and Jackson decided together at, at a famous uh, bivouac called the Cracker Box Meeting. And on the right, you see the site of it. This was, I'll show you where this is on the map. At the end of day one, uh, Lee and Jackson decided on a bold move. And in fact, it was Jackson really that suggested it. And as they met in this spot, which you can see in the, in the uh, modern picture, it's marked by the Park Service. You can uh, see that today. Uh, Jackson proposed a very bold attack on Hooker, which was to bring uh, the bulk of the forces that Lee had on a wide flank attack around to the west and then north coming in on the right flank of Hooker. And I'll show you a map of this, so don't, don't worry about trying to figure this out in your mind right now. But just be aware that Jackson was proposing a very uh, daring uh, uh, all-day march to get on Hooker's flank and uh, at this meeting. Now, Lee had left uh, uh, some units back at Fredericksburg to guard the crossings, uh, several brigades in, uh, in, in Early's division. Um, and Jackson proposed to take almost all of his men and leave Lee with only two divisions up against Hooker's entire force at Fredericksburg, uh, excuse me, at Chancellorsville. So the, the flank attack Jackson proposed would really pack a wallop. And let's go ahead to the next slide. I believe it's a, a map that you'll see. Um, so this looks a little bit confusing, but um, I'm, I'm gonna go through this map here. So you can see, let's start on the right where you see uh, Lee and Cracker Box meeting. That's where they met um, at the intersection of the Orange Plank Road and Furnace Road. Uh, that's where most of Lee's troops were other than those back in Fredericksburg. Now, let's move back to um, Hooker. The, the Union commander, General Hooker, decided that he was going to pull up his troops and guard around the position at Chancellorsville. And this has been a very controversial decision on his part. For years, historians have looked at this. Um, there's been some mistaken quotes attributed to Hooker that really uh, uh, were not true. But Hooker had, the, Hooker had the offensive. He had the momentum. And his troops were really kind of moving close to Fredericksburg on three different roads. But he was really taken, taken back when uh, his men met the Confederates advancing on the Orange Plank Road and the Orange Turnpike, as we saw a few maps back. So he decided, well, I've got the bulk of my troops on the south side of the river. He had a, a good position mapped out around Chancellorsville and commanded the roads the, that would, Lee would need to move on him. And he was going to let Meade uh, excuse me, he was going to let Lee attack him around Chancellorsville. Now, a long time ago, there was one quote that came out 
saying that uh, supposedly that that someone asked him why he had stopped and 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 given up the initiative and the the offensive, he he allegedly said uh, for 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 that on that day, I lost confidence in Hooker. Now, uh, historian Stephen Sears has done a, a good job of pointing out that that quote was attributed to Hooker decades after the battle and also after his death so that he couldn't refute that when it was in writing. There's the really the, the main reason Hooker decided not to keep pressing toward Fredericksburg is because once he knew that Lee was in the field, not behind his strong defenses at Fredericksburg, that he could eventually get Lee to attack him uh, in this area around Chancellorsville. So you can see the Union positions around Chancellorsville. And Chancellorsville is just above the uh, yellow star that's in the middle of the map. So the Union left flank, which is at the top right of the map with where Meade is, was pretty secure. Uh, the next core down is Couch. His men were in the Chancellorsville area and Meade had troops south of the Chancellorsville crossing. Uh, some under Sickles, which is near where that yellow star is at Hazel Grove, they were in an advanced position, um, kind of a salient. And finally, there were where there was the core of Oliver Howard on the right hand side of Hooker's line, which is on our left. And you can see where it says Howard. Now, Jackson and his troops set out on the morning of May 2nd from the area where the Cracker Box meeting was. A lot of the troops were camped in that area and back toward Fredericksburg. And as you can see by the red line that goes from, uh, that, that shows Jackson's route, he went uh, west, then south toward where it says May 2nd uh, on a very narrow road all the way uh, down toward the bottom of the map, then turned north and his, his objective was to come in on Howard's right, our left, and smash Howard from the west where the Confederates assumed the Union Army would not expect them to be. It's a very bold move, very typical of Lee, um, but a very bold move and Hooker's men simply were not prepared for that. Now, where you see the yellow star is Hazel Grove. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. That was a key terrain. It was open ground. Uh, it was a, a little higher than some of the surrounding terrain. And it was occupied by General Sickles' third court. You can see Dan Sickles at the bottom left the picture of him. When Jackson's men started marching to, from the location of the Cracker Box meeting toward the west on the Furnace Road, Sickles and his, some of his men could see Jackson moving and raised the alarm about the possibility of, of the Confederates attacking their right flank, which is exactly what they did. But in order for Jackson to get at the Union right flank, he was guided by some locals on very narrow roads. And one of the things they had to do is at, an, at a furnace, an iron furnace known as Catherine Furnace, they had to make a left to the south. And when they did, including their wagons, their troops, their horses, uh, other officers assumed, since they were moving south and away from the Union position, that Jackson was actually retreating and Lee was pulling back. So Hooker didn't really know what to do or what to make of it at, at this point. Um, there, was a, there was a gap in the, in the line, which I'll show you a picture of where they could see the rebels moving. So Sickles sent some troops forward from Hazel Grove toward the furnace and actually uh, captured most of the 23rd Georgia in that area. But hearing the firing, uh, the two rear brigades in Jackson's long, long column 
turned around and defended that area so the rest of Jackson's flank march could continue. Jackson's flank march uh, is about, I'd say about 10 miles long. Uh, they, the, the delays uh, were because of the very narrow roads, the need to bring some artillery, horses, wagons. But as you can see at the top right, I'm sorry, the top left corner of the map, you can see Jackson's lines lined up in three, uh, three lines ready to attack Howard. Now, Hooker took the intelligence seriously that there were Confederates moving in a Western direction that could be dangerous. And he sent at least a, um, at least one message to Howard saying, we have some indication that, that your flank might be attached. Please be on the lookout and fortify and occupy a proper position so that you're not attacked on your right flank. And uh, later, Howard denied that. But the, uh, the message book of Howard's core show that that message was received. It was recorded in that book. And um, it, he, was, he did receive it. Howard's, Howard's Corps was made up almost entirely of German-speaking troops. Many of them recently arrived from Europe. They had a very bad reputation of uh, being, of being um, uh, green, uh, not being quality troops, and unreliable. And uh, so it was indicative of Hooker's belief that he was not going to be flanked, that he put those poor quality troops on the right flank. And even when he received signs that the enemy might be approaching, uh, he still left Howard out there. He tried to get one of the corps from back in Fredericksburg, uh, the first corps under General Reynolds, to march immediately from Fredericksburg on the north side of the river and cross at one of the close fords so that they could reinforce Howard and shore up the right flank. But because of, of mixed up communications and distances, uh, uh, Reynolds was long delayed in getting that message. And so um, he, he did not get that message. Now, one more thing I wanna point out here is uh, originally, the Jackson's flank attack, excuse me. Jackson's flank attack was going to turn down the road, meaning they were going to make a right east on the road you see that leads to Burton Hill. But Confederate cavalry showed that if he did that, he would be coming in not on the flank, but in Howard's front. So they passed that road and came in on the Orange Turnpike near the Wilderness Tavern. Uh, and this attack that you see on the map on the top right, that routed Howard's men. You can see the dotted arrows, meaning that's where the troops were fleeing. They fled all the way back to Chancellorsville. It was a wild success. Uh, if anything, for the Confederates, the one negative was that it took so long to get to the point of attack and lined up in the wilderness that they really ran out of sun, sun, uh, sunlight um, before they could do all the damage that they expected. But this is, this is a great map uh, that shows uh, where Jackson came in on the flank. And it was a wild success, uh, routed division after division uh, men threw their rifles down without uh, firing them, ran for their lives back to Chancellorsville. Okay, let's uh, go to the next slide. Okay, a couple of modern pictures. Um, the one on the left is a, um, it's where the gap in the trees were, was that uh, the uh, Union observers were able to see Jackson's men moving along the road to the west. Um, now, the, the park rangers have told me that this site uh, was much more open at the time, 
so it was a, uh, much easier to view, but th there is this gap that's been left to represent where that spot was. And the other one is just a representation of part of Jackson's flank march route. Uh, it, it, it was much narrower than this, even though this is a one, one and a half dirt road, one and a half lane dirt gravel road, it was a lot more narrow, but this is part of the road after Jackson turned, um, turned south at Catherine Furnace. Okay, next slide, please. All right, this is a close up of the map showing uh, where this action took place. So this is the Catherine Furnace and the, you can see the 23rd Georgia is located at that spot to guard that area. And you can see kind of, uh, the, the red of the road there where Jackson's flank march kept going uh, to get onto um, Hooker's right flank. Uh, Bernie here was one of Sickles division commanders and uh, his men attacked to the furnace and got very close and there was some there was significant fighting in this area but eventually uh, confederate reinforcements turned back this attack by sickles but i i, I wanted to include this to uh, show the detail okay next slide please okay on the left is the re is the remnants of the iron furnace uh, this is where this is where the 23rd Georgia was, and this is kind of where Jackson's men would turn to the left in this image down the road uh, that would eventually lead them on their circuitous march to the Union flank. On the right is looking the opposite direction, so that uh, the road you can see the road goes out into the background. From that background is where Bernie's Union troops of the Third Corps came out to attack the 23rd Georgia and captured, uh, captured almost the entire regiment. And both of these sites are part of the Chancellorsville battlefield, which is, which is part of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania uh, National Battlefield Parks. Okay, let's move on. Okay, um, this is the same, uh, same event, but, but shown in a period map that uh, was colored and uh, uh, prepared by Union troops, uh, Union officers. You can see Jackson on the top left coming in with the red units and how he, the lines show how far his men advanced. They hit the Union Army 11th and 12th Corps uh, near Wilderness Church, the site of which you can see from the road. It's uh, from modern Route 3. It's not a uh, period building. But it pushed the pushed the um, Union troops back to one uh, a, a line that they were somehow able to collect artillery, some reinforcements, and um, were able to start to by dark to get Jackson um, Jackson's troops uh, to slow up and eventually dig some uh, very quick. Uh, field works, breastworks, pits, fire pits. Uh, toward the right, you can see the beginning of that line uh, start to form um, near near Dowdle's Tavern uh, on the right edge of this map here. But this is a this is a interesting uh, colored uh, map from the the uh, time period. Okay, next. Uh, this image is taken from where Jackson's men began to emerge out of the woods from the west, moving east on mostly the north side of the Orange Turnpike, but some troops were on the south side. And uh, this is what it looks like today. This is Some of this is Park Service land, some of this is easements, um, but the Park Service has put in uh, some signage and a, a small parking lot in this area off of Route 3. And that's where this was taken from. But this would have been the view that the Confederates had heading toward the Union Army right flank. And if you can make it out on the right hand side, you can see some cars on a road in front of trees, just a little bit to that, just a little bit to the left of where those cars are in our image here. That's where the end of the 
uh, Union Army was under Howard that got flanked and routed. One of the interesting stories about, about this is that the Union soldiers were laying in camp. Uh, they, had, they were tired from marching. They were resting. They were not really putting up much as far as defenses because they did not think they were going to be attacked. And at some point prior to Jackson's thousands and thousands of men coming out of the woods, uh, they were surprised to see running toward them uh, rabbits and deer and wild turkeys that, that were being pushed through the woods in front of the Confederates. And at first they were, they were laughing about it because it seemed so unusual for all that game to come at them. And then they saw the huge long lines of Confederates emerge from the woods and uh, they realized that they were, they were under attack. Okay, next slide, please. Here's a, a newspaper image of the stampede of the 11th Corps. Uh, that's Jackson's troops coming at them from the rear woods. Uh, the smoke that you see out in front uh, are Union Army cannon firing toward the woods to try to stop the attack, but uh, most of these troops eventually ran back toward Chancellorsville. All right, next, please. Okay, the third day of the battle, this was really kind of the last day of, of active fighting. Overnight, most of you know, the, over the night of Jackson, uh, of uh, May 2nd and 3rd, uh, Jackson went out at night with several staff officers and uh, to scout the enemy position, uh, the enemy being the North. So they were, they were uh, scouting the Union position. Uh, between the Confederate line and Chancellorsville. And west of Chancellorsville was very wooded. Uh, there were few roads, few trails. And Jackson and his, and his staff officers were trying to figure out where the Union Army line was now that it had, it had been routed uh, during the daylight hours. They were figure, trying to figure out where it was located so they knew where to attack. And you can see from the map, um, I have Chancellorsville uh, located there um, on a map. You can see the crossroads right above the U in the word Slocum, uh, kind of in the center of the map. So they were the, the, the Union troops uh, were the ones that were routed, uh, particularly the 12th Corps. They were brought to the upper right of this map. Uh, on a road to one of the Fords. And the other troops were centered around the uh, Chancellorsville intersection. Now, one very questionable uh, um, order that Hooker gave was to have Sickles evacuate Hazel Grove. Remember, that's where there, it was a high area. It was open. Uh, it, it was very advantageous ground, especially for artillery, and I've got it mapped. I've got it located there. You can see in the with a blue arrow to Hazel Grove. Um, the Lee was quick to get troops in there, but even more so, he was able to put a little over 30 cannons on that high ground that really had an open view of a house called Fairview, which you can see uh, on the map just above Slocum's line, and Chancellorsville. Uh, E.P. Alexander was the Confederate artilleryman then, that recognized this, and they quickly brought, brought guns up to that position. But the real event that happened overnight uh, and, and what, what really was very significant was while Jackson was uh, scouting between the lines, he was mortally wounded by his own men who thought that it was Union cavalry in their front. So it was very dark and uh, a regiment of North Carolina troops uh, were skittish about it and, and shot into the, shot into the, um, uh, the horsemen, the, the party of mounted men. Jackson was wounded, uh, had to have his, uh, uh, his arm amputated that day, that evening, and was eventually moved to a place called Guinea Station, uh, south of Fredericksburg, um, and uh, eventually died of pneumonia uh, several days afterwards. 
So his his corps was taken over by the famous uh, cavalryman, uh, Major General Jeb Stewart. So this was kind of the situation where Lee was trying to re reunite his army because he wanted to be in touch with Jackson's men and his main body near Chancellorsville. And after some very, very vicious and bloody attacks, um, <clears throat> this uh, he was able to do that and, and pin uh, who, uh, Hooker to the Chancellorsville area. Now, we, we, it's, it's um, associated, many people think of Chancellorsville, you think of Jackson being mortally wounded and the flank attack. Uh, Hooker's big maneuver that was almost successful. But really, the fighting on the third day was mo some of the most uh, bitter, heavy fighting, uh, the heaviest casualties of the entire war. It was uh, attack against fixed positions with Lee trying to push the Union Army back toward the river and catch them midstream, trying to uh, capture or collapse as much as he could uh, with, with the Union Army having a, a very disadvantageous position uh, trying to cross a river under attack. Well, that didn't happen, but Lee's army with uh, Stuart here now taking Jackson's place and his own attacks, uh, that's what the main fighting was. And uh, unfortunately, in the time that we have, we really can't go into a lot of detail because it was really one attack after another. The other significant thing that happened, actually, let's go to the next slide before we talk about uh, about Hooker, and we'll go back to him. Here's a shot of uh, Hazel Grove. You can see how open it is. Uh, this is part of the battlefield today with uh, representations of Confederate artillery. Uh, next, please. Okay, this is the view that the Confederate cannoneers would have had from Hazel Grove toward Fairview. And Fairview is very close and on the other side of the Turnpike, modern Route 3, from Chancellorsville. And if you look at that distance, distant wood line, just in front of that distant wood line uh, from left to right, right to left, is uh, the turnpike, the orange turnpike, which is which is modern three. And that's where the Union artillery had taken up a position. There was a Union troops there, but uh, you can see how Sickles really did give up a very good and open position that the Confederates really took advantage of. And uh, for those of you who visit Chancellorsville or, or get a chance to go, uh, there's a nice hike of about two miles that goes from Hazel Grove to Fairview. I think you can kind of see it in the grass there. And um, let's have the next slide, please. Now these are these are the Union positions at Fairview, looking back toward Hazel Grove. It's kind of the opposite view that we just had. And what happened was a lot of Confederates came through those trees right in front of you uh, after being hammered by artillery. Uh, they were able to to start pushing toward the Union lines, and I want to take a, a try to get a good picture on the right are what's called lunettes, and those were kind of half moon sh uh, shaped uh, um, embankments that protected Union artillery, um, and this is these are some of the remaining ones that still are around at uh, at Fairview. Okay, next uh, next um, slide, please. Now this this would have been Lee and Stewart's view on one of the final Confederate uh, positions, uh, the the Union positions that they were assaulting. This was the view that the Confederates would would have of Hick, uh, of of Hooker's position. So this is at Fairview. You can see a couple of white cars uh, uh, silhouetted up against the dark trees. That's the Orange Turnpike, and this would have been the Orange Turnpike, and where we're looking from now was really the axis of their of the Confederate assaults, um, <laughs> including some from the uh, the tree line you can see on the right. That's uh, on the other side of that is south of Chancellorsville, and uh, some of Lee's divisions also attacked from that way. But this gives you a good kind of feel for the ground and, and where the 
Confederate assaults came from against the Union troops who were packed in on there um, at Chancellorsville. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, um, that's Hooker on our right and uh, kind of an interesting um, post-war uh, image of Chancellorsville in the back. At this point, Hooker was in command. This is on day three, this is May 3rd. And at some point in the morning, he was standing in front of or on the porch of the Chancellor house there. And a Confederate solid shot hit the post, knocking it down uh, and collapsing onto Hooker. And he was knocked unconscious solid for 45 minutes. They were not able to wake him or to revive him at all, which you can imagine the confusion among the other officers, the Corps commanders, that the Army commander has now been knocked out. Uh, the Confederates are attacking. It's severe fighting. And they were finally uh, able to revive Hooker who said, I turn over command to the commander of the second corps, Darius Couch. And however, I want him to do this and that. So that's not really turning over command if you also order somebody to do something. Um, and, and so Couch was very frustrated. Uh, Hooker eventually revived enough so that the Union Army began a retreat from Chancellorsville north back towards some of the close fords over the Rappahannock. But they occupied a very strong position uh, along the roads in the wilderness um, that gave them a lot of cover, made artillery very difficult to use for the enemy to blast their lines, also difficult for cavalry to move. But uh, that was that was an, a, a significant part of that day was Hooker's incapacitation for a, a significant amount of time. Okay, let's move on. Now uh, you can see Chancellorsville is down at the bottom, and the new Union position is in a U shape uh, with the right flank up at the top right where it says Reynolds secure on the Rapidan River, and then moving down toward uh, what became known as the Apex. There's, there's a house that belonged to the Bullock family on the south, uh, kind of the south corner of that Apex. And from there, the rest of the troops were lined up along Mineral Springs Road, which uh, led to the river also and to another ford. Now you can see uh, they put Howard's men in the back, uh, not on the front lines. Uh, Hooker decided he was not going to risk that again. Um, so this was the position that Lee was preparing to attack. And the arrows are, are late in the day of May 3rd, showing that the Union Army crossed back onto the north side of the river at U.S. Ford on, on pontoon bridges. OK, uh, uh, next slide, please. These are some modern images. Um, the left is the apex. So we have the road running off to the background on the left. That's Ely's Ford Road. That was one part of the U. And on the right, seemingly going into the trees, but you can see how the road looks today on the right hand image. But where I where I labeled Mineral Springs Road, um, that you can see goes off to the right, our right, and Union troops were lined up all the way from this point to the river. Uh, there's some trails back in there, and you can get to uh, get to some of the areas where the Union troops were lined up, and Lee was pre preparing to attack them here. Okay, next up. Okay, so on the follow, following uh, on that afternoon, while Lee was preparing 
to continue attacking the Union lines, which we just saw, he got word that there was trouble back at Fredericksburg. And as this map shows you, General Sedgwick was able to come across the pontoon bridge at Fredericksburg and push the Confederates out of their positions uh, guarding the town. And he was started on the Plank Road, which is right, you can see Plank Road in the middle of this uh, map, on his way to come up behind Lee's army. So Lee had to once again divide his army and send divisions under General Richard Anderson and Lafayette McClaws back toward Fredericksburg to help the Confederates under General Jubal Early uh, defeat or at least prevent Sedgwick and his Sixth Corps from landing in Lee's rear. Um, next slide, please. So this is the Salem Church battlefield. That's the church on the left. And the firing was all in this area. This was kind of on high ground. And you can see uh, the Confederate position uh, from the right hand from the right hand image. Uh, that's actually a monument to New Jersey troops, the 23rd New Jersey. So the fighting was all along this ridge that the uh, that the um, church is on. The church is still standing, still part of the battlefield, but as you can see on the right-hand image, uh, most of the battlefield is all suburban, uh, suburban sprawl and uh, big box stores, gas stations, that thing. So, um, but you kind of can see a little bit of how we're on the high ground here. Cedric, uh, Sedgwick actually made it across the Rappahannock River um, uh, later on that evening, Lee was not able to catch him uh, or destroy him. So uh, this, this uh, uh, was inconclusive in Lee's mind because, again, once again, he was not able to really destroy the Union Army in retreat um, uh, once again. So let's move to the last few slides here so we can get to some questions. These are some great images from the Library of Congress of the aftermath. That's the Chancellor House on the left. If you, if you go there today, you'll see some foundations, but the house is no longer standing. And some of the terrain, I, you, you can see there on the right how difficult movement would be, especially during uh, uh, the spring months of May 1863. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, interestingly, Hooker gets the army back toward Fredericksburg uh, and they're basically defeated, lost 17,000 troops or so. And uh, Lincoln had had high hopes for Hooker. Uh, he had high hopes that he would be able to uh, defeat Lee, get him in an open battlefield, and uh, move on toward Richmond or to continue to fight in open country, relatively open country across the Virginia Piedmont. And when he received the telegraph uh, from Hooker stating that they had been pushed back uh, they had lost the battle and, and thousands of men. Uh, his remarks to uh, his associates in, in the room with him once he received the telegraph was, my God, my God, what will the country say? It, it was another defeat. They had been defeated at the Union Army of the Potomac, had been defeated at uh, Second Manassas earlier that year, Fredericksburg that we talked about. Uh, McClellan uh, had been pushed out of the peninsula in the Seven Days Battles, so it was another it was another tough uh, defeat for for the Union Army and Lincoln. The first question, let me expand this a little bit, um, is um, from our, our friend Ed, who's a loyal uh, attendee at these uh, at our book talks and battle briefs. Out of all the battles and Union units in the Civil War. Why was the cast figure of the second New Jersey corporal before the battle of second Fredericksburg chosen for display in the museums preserving the nation gallery? Um, Ed, I'm going to have to get you the answer for that from our exhibits team, which uh, I am unfamiliar with why that was um, why that was chosen, but we can definitely get that answer from you from uh, from our exhibits department. Thank you. Um, let's see, I've been doing research into the 124th New York. Can you tell me the role General Whipple and his division played in the battle? 
Um, I do not have a lot of information on each of the divisions uh, for our program. Uh, I can recommend uh, some books, however, on the Battle of Chancellorsville, particularly uh, by uh, Ernest Ferguson uh, and Stephen Sears. Those are probably the two best on Chancellorsville. Uh, so hopefully those will be two good resources for you. The Army uh, Center of Military History also published um, a number of pamphlets back around the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And um, there is a separate pamphlet that is solely on Chancellorsville. It's available online at history.army.mil and uh, it's available free as a PDF also. Okay, um, another question here is um, uh, from an army historian friend of ours. Uh, your maps did not show it, but do you think the failure of the Union uh, cavalry raid toward Richmond contributed to Hooker's defeat? So uh, that is also a similar question uh, to that we have is the cavalry. Uh, for some reason, that's never, that even Stephen Sears, the author of the most recent comprehensive book on the battle, uh, mentions is that Hooker, Hooker gathered his cavalry and sent them on an ill-advised raid toward Richmond at the time of this battle. And that deprived him of his intelligence gathering, his scouting, um, uh, and also firepower. Uh, he, it, it was a significant mistake that he never really explained. And so to your question, I do agree that that, that, was, um, that was not a, a good time to do it. Uh, similarly, uh, Lee allowed his cavalry to move off uh, on the way to Pennsylvania during the Gettysburg campaign for which he and Jeb Stewart have been criticized. But also, at the beginning stages of the Battle of the Wilderness between uh, Grant and Lee in 1864, uh, General Meade, who was the commander of the Army of the Potomac, also sent Sheridan with a significant amount of his cavalry off on a raid as well toward Richmond, mostly because Meade hated Sheridan and wanted him out of his hair. So, um, but it was, it was a, a pretty significant blunder. Um, so another question, uh, how important was Beverly Tucker Lacey in guiding Jackson on the flank march? Uh, Lacey was a local. Uh, the Lacey House um, is, uh, has been restored. It's a beautiful job that they've done on Park Service property called Elwood. Uh, it's available uh, seasonally and periodically. I visited there many times. Um, and, and great programming down there. So that, that I recommend that. Uh, but yes, very influential. Uh, also one of the, um, one of the Burtons um, in the area too, where the flank attack came in um, and some folks, some other soldiers who uh, had grown up in that area were also, um, were also involved. Okay, let's take one more question um, about Lee, okay, why was Lee disappointed in the results of the battle that he won? Well, here, here is the explanation on that. It's a great question and, and, and um, is, is very uh, subject to interpretation. Um, Lee realized early on that he could not replace the troops that he lost in battle as easily as the North. And so while he might have defeated Hooker and caused 17,000 casualties, Lee's were only several, several thousand uh, less than that, and they were almost irreplaceable. So uh, he was not really able to uh, uh, destroy a huge amount of the Union Army formations, the Divisions Corps, capture thousands and thousands, he wanted a decisive victory where Hooker surrendered to him, um, his entire army to him. And that didn't happen. And the same thing back at Salem Church later on the evening of the 3rd of May, uh, he thought that they had a, 
a, a splendid opportunity to capture and destroy Sedgwick's entire Sixth Corps, but um, because of difficulties in communication, uh, it was the third day of a long, long battle, uh, of a three-day battle, he was not able to do that. So uh, he, he recognized that, that that's really what would happen. So with that, again, thanks to everybody for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you at our next program.